Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Hatchie River Conservancy. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? I discovered the Moth Orchid Lego sculpture we have with the Sean Kenny exhibit. It's made of 2,300 Lego bricks and took 20 hours to build. But a fun did you know fact I discovered about the real Moth Orchid is like humans, they get sunburned. You know, I think it's interesting that Sean Kenny's exhibit has little factoids like that throughout. So not only do you get to experience the coolness of the actual sculpture, but you get to see all the really cool um uh, facts about the different ones so good job so today's very special guest is jason reeves he is a garden tour garden lecturer and writer photographer landscape designer and consultant with more than 20 years experience uh, in the green industry and i'm going to let us tell us i'm gonna let him tell us what what he does at ut martin um not, i'm sorry at ut the UT system, is that who you work for? So, yeah, I work for the University of Tennessee at the gardens in Jackson. So the University of Tennessee, Tennessee has three gardens, one located in Knoxville on the Ag Campus, one located in Crossville at a research and education center, and then the one in Jackson. Um, most of the, the work there is cotton, corn, and soybeans, and myself and my two assistants work in the horticulture field. All three of those UT gardens are open daylight to dark uh, for your enjoyment to come out year-round, and all three of those collectively are known as the State Botanic Garden of Tennessee. Yeah, I noticed um, I had that in my notes that I that that's a pretty big deal considering, you know, the whole state and all the horticulture that exists here. Tennessee is a very green state. It is. Yeah, it's kind of cool that the three gardens make up the state botanic garden because usually a state just has one. And so we kind of have one, even though Crossville is really considered in the eastern region, it's kind of the edge of of the middle Tennessee, you know, so it's we uh, kind of got the three areas of the country kind of or the state kind of covered. And so uh, each one has a little bit different focus. Obviously, in Knoxville, that's the teaching campus. So horticulture is taught there. And so the students use that campus a lot for their 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 classes there. Uh, the one in Crossville is uh, mostly other types of research. They do tomatoes. They do um, cattle there. Um, and then they do have the gardens there. And they do a lot of teaching with with school groups, young school groups. They have a program called kindergarten, uh, working with young kids. And then the one in Jackson is more, we do more actually more trial research. We're growing plants to see how they perform in our climate. We also have a really big master gardener program in, in the Madison County area, which actually covers all the surrounding counties as well. And so our focus is a little bit different there, uh, but all three together, we work together in, 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 in unity and, and have a wonderful garden across the state. Yeah. I mean, you clearly, you know, um, are award winning, you're on social media, you're the garden guy here in Tennessee. Um, but let's back all the way up to the beginning in Huntington, Tennessee. That's right. So I grew up in a in a small community called Concord, ha- kind of halfway between Huntington and Clarksburg on a small cattle farm. It was my grandparents' farm. My parents built their house on it and fell in love with gardening and nature on that farm. Um, with we, I mean, we had cattle, we had chickens, we had pigs growing up, and then a big vegetable garden. And then my mother and grandmother uh, also enjoyed flowers, and we just grew them in rows in our vegetable garden. That's kind of where my start got, is just growing things from seed primarily in the vegetable garden and I just kind of fell in love with it from there and then I had two older ladies when I was a teenager that were big gardeners that were kind of my mentors and they shared plants with me they were friends of my grandparents and I became my friends and so it kind of went from there and then uh, I didn't want to go far from home, so I went to UT Martin and didn't really have horticulture there. It was grounds management. But it was the closest thing they had and, and studied there and then decided to go into grad school at Knoxville and where I have a degree from ornamental horticulture and landscape design, uh, a master's degree from Knoxville. So you you touched on it, but you know what what I love the most about following you on social media and, uh, and um, seeing you on Facebook and all the posts that you make is the, the people that you uh, encounter along the way. Um, tell us about some of your favorite, uh, West Tennessee gardens. Yeah. You know, I enjoy with, with my social media page, my Facebook page, which is Jason Reeves dash symbol in the garden. Uh, I really enjoy sharing things, what's going on in my home garden, what I'm doing at the university, what, what's going on at my farm, but also what, when I'm visiting other people's gardens and what they're doing in their garden, I feel like sharing that information, whether it's about some insect or disease or time to plant or prune, you know, it helps you in your home garden, but then being able to share other people's gardens. You know, last week I was at Nancy Davis 
in Clinton, Kentucky. Uh, I went after work. I've been trying to on Mondays go after work somewhere, taking some friends with me when we get off work. And so we visited that garden there. And you know, people enjoy seeing other people's gardens. You know, we can travel all over the world, which I very much enjoy garden travel, and I normally do an international trip a year. But there's so much in our own backyard. Just today, driving through Union City, I was in a neighborhood, and sorry, I can't tell you where I was, but as I was driving around, I was like, heck, I'd like to knock on the door and walk through their garden. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot in our own backyard I'm if we sure just slow down and look it in. They would be happy for you, too, I bet. <laughs> um, I don't know who's, whose house it was, but we can we can work that out for you. Um yeah, so um, how do you find these folks? How do you find all these people, all these great gardens that you check out? You know, gardeners, uh, we're well connected. You know, we, we whether they meet together at some garden event or some plant sale or, you you know, you see somebody at a local nursery, uh, you know, you belong to organizations and societies. You know, the Master Gardener Program, which is an international program that started in the United States, is a very good uh, area to network in a group to, to learn from. And so a lot of it just comes from from talking to each other and, and uh, sometimes yeah, knocking on the door and say, hey, you know, <laughs> uh, and once you, you know, plant people, when you get to talking to each other, you get all excited and and you want to share. I mean, you grow these things for yourself, but you also in, you enjoy people appreciating them for yourself. So always sharing with other people is part of that. So, I mean, it, it, for, for folks out there listening who grow uh, flowers and all different types of shrubs and, you know, plants and, you know, I think they would agree that it's both rewarding but also challenging when you think something's going to look a certain way and you work really hard to get it there and then it just doesn't happen. Well, and Discovery Park is a great example of that. <laughs> you know, the challenges y'all have here, particularly with drainage, has been a major issue since before you opened and and will continue to be. And so, uh, yeah, gardening can be very, very challenging. It can be very rewarding. And uh, just this morning, I, I've taken off work today and I was helping anagram here just with the property beside us here with the, the Holiday Inn and the drainage issues there. And, you know, choosing the right plant for the right place is very important. And, and you know, the, there's, there's no way to fix some of these drainage issues, but we're going to pick plants that will tolerate that. So there's a lot in, you know, working with, um, talking with other people, other gardeners, that's how you learn these things. And, you know, maybe or belonging to an organization or a master gardener program, but a lot of it is just learning by doing and again, talking with other people and, and seeing what's going to work. So it can be, again, very challenging, but also rewarding in the end. And then, of course, sharing those, your, your success with other people. Uh, is very rewarding. Well, that's what I love about your your Facebook page um, is that it really does a great job. And I'm going to ask you in in a few minutes about the other social medias and and you know the brand of Jason Reeves. I'm curious about that. You know, from a communication standpoint. But um, so I have found that sometimes, like living here, it gets so hot mm, yes. that I just water, 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 and sometimes that. I have discovered kills the oh, plants yes. that, you know, I've got multiple plants that I couldn't figure out. Why is this dying? And looked up, you know, g give us uh, some of the things like that. Some of the tips that come to you at the top of your mind for this area. One of the number one, the, the number one killer of plants is actually too much water. Uh, whether it's excessive rainfall and or, or it's uh, poor drainage, which is an issue here in this area, uh, particularly at my farm in the same way in Clarksburg where I live, um, but also overwatering from our irrig irrigation systems. And, you know, it's very important that uh, we don't, um, you know, waste water. And so when you're watering, you need to count for what's falling from the sky. And so if you have an automatic irrigation system, you know, you can buy a device to put on it that collects the rainfall from the sky and, and, and uh, takes that into account. So, uh, yeah, it's important to, to know your soil, to know your climate. And just because a plant's wilted does not mean it needs water. It means it it's not taking up the water or it can't take it up fast enough. And it could be that it, the roots are rotted off and so it can't take up the water. So it's wilting. Some plants will just wilt in the heat of the day because they can't take up the water fast enough. And there may be plenty there. So you kind of got to know the plant. You've got to check out your soil. And again, networking with other gardeners in the area uh, really helps make you become a more sex successful gardener. Yeah, I mean, the, the soil health to me is something that I've really been trying to learn more about and figure out um, because we live on, in an area where a house was constructed. And so the soil around the house is nasty yeah. and full of sand and construction materials. And, you know, so, um, you know, getting the new soil in there has really been challenging. 
Yeah, it, it's definitely a challenge in a new site or, you know, f f again, back to the Discovery Park here, just imagine the equipment it took to build all this, the compaction of the soil and, you know, whether you're same situation at your home, you know, all that construction debris and, and all that equipment, uh, trying to get that soil back into good health, you know, fluffing that soil back up, adding organic matter. And sometimes that just takes years of, of letting things decay. You know, we typically here in, in West Tennessee use hardwood mulch just as a, a byproduct of the lumber industry. And over time, time that builds your soil up and adds the micronutrients and now you know the critters are breaking that soil down and sometimes we complain why our mulch doesn't last very long well that's a sign that it's breaking down and actually feeding and building your soil so that's not a bad thing and that's you know where you're using um you know for instance um rubber mulch you know, something i'd strongly discourage or gravel you know the gravel is not going to actually help build your soil it does have its place in, in certain applications but but that organic matter from the mulch that we use really and it helps prove your soil over time too so it does take time and bed prep to me is the number one thing you should you should spend more money on that than you do your plants getting that soil prepped properly before planting and if you do that right the first time then you'll be successful and it does take some time and it also takes some knowledge and again talking to people and trying to figure it all out what's your what's your uh, go to you've got a friend let's say you've got a friend who has a completely clean palate What's your go-to plants you tell them? Say it's full sun. What's your go-to plants you tell it? Full everybody? sun to me is is the easiest to work with. Shade can be more challenging, particularly if it's shade from trees because trees are sucking water. So yeah, if I if, if I had my choices, I, if you were give me a shade or sun garden, I would work. I would choose that that sun. So some of my go-to plants, uh, tough plants. You know, right now the paniculata hydrangeas. Those are the sun-loving hydrangeas. The limelight, the quick fire, the those are the big of, white ones. Yes, that, and some okay. people call them snowballs. Snowballs is actually yeah. a viburnum that blooms in the spring, so okay. it gets a little confusing but we have a lot of those around yes. here and i clipped um, i wanted to see if i could get them to root mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. i clipped a few of them uh, earlier this year and they have rooted oh, yeah, and i'm yeah, getting ready yeah. to transplant them so yeah those sun love the hydrangea paniculas are, are one of my go-tos um some uh i love um I mean, I love mixing different textures and different colors. You know, ornamental grasses give you a different texture. There's their, their native uh, purple mooly grass. Uh, some of the miscanthus, some of the ones that don't form seed, like miscanthus morning light, gives you a lot of texture in the garden. Uh, Japanese cedar, Cryptomeria japonica, one of my favorite ones called Globosa nana, is a kind of a naturally roundy, moundy shrub. It doesn't have to be trimmed. You know, I'm not into trimming things into meatballs. If it naturally grows like a meatball, that's okay. <laughs> but I don't want to make a meatball out of something. So I'm not into a lot of trimming. Another favorite is a, a spirea called Ogon, uh, has gold foliage blooms in January, February, uh, beautiful gold color in the summer and a good uh, fall color. Some of our native uh, junipers, there's different cultivars of junipers, there's one called gray owl, which gets really big. Unfortunately, landscapers tend to use it too close to the house and don't give it room, but it's a beautiful blue uh, tough juniper, very drought tolerant. That gives you a lot of interest throughout the year and in the winter time as well. So there's a lot of wonderful plants we can choose from if we do our homework and, and choose those. And you know, I'm not a. Uh, I love native plants and I use a lot of native plants, but I'm not a purist. I'm going to be mixing. You know, I want to choose the best plant for the best site. Um, and just because it's native, that doesn't mean it's going to perform in your area. For instance, if you got poor drainage, you're not going to get a dogwood to live in it. Even though it's native, it's not going to survive in it or flowering dogwood. Now you could grow a red, red twig dogwood which is more of a shrubby plant. So uh, you really got to do some work and, and, and choose the plant, the best plant for the site. And then what about shade? Um, so shade, shade's a challenge. It is more of a challenge. Um, I love our hydrangea macrophyllas. I've just posted this weekend about uh, the some of the endless summer. The endless summer were developed to bloom on new growth. So if they freeze the ground like they did in the Arctic blast of January, I'm sorry, December 2022, and then this past winter, a lot of our hydrangeas froze back. Those those macrophylla hydrangeas. Uh, the endless summer uh, twist and shout, bloom struck, summer crush, and pop star all will flower on new growth. So they're all blooming now, even though they froze down down to the ground. So the old fashioned hydrangea macrophylla will not bloom on new growth. So choosing the proper one to begin with, they're going to make you more successful. Uh, Annabelle hydrangeas. Annabelle is a hydrangea arborescence, which is a native species of hydrangea, a really tough one. It'll actually grow in the sun. It prefers shade, but it, it will grow in sun. Uh, oak leaf hydrangea is another great one for the shade. Oak leaf's also native. Oak leaf, it's really important to have good draining soil for it. Um, those are great shade plants. Uh, Edgeworthy or paper bush um, is a good uh, shade plant that blooms uh, in March, uh, late, yeah, late February, early March. Very fragrant. Uh, love it for the shade garden. Uh, some perennials. You know, we have lots of wonderful ferns. There's uh, our native Christmas fern. There's uh, 
uh, autumn fern, which is evergreen. The Christmas fern is evergreen as well. Uh, Hellebores is a great shade plant. Uh, so there's a there's a big selection of, of shade plants as well. You just have to keep in mind, is the shade from a, a lot of big trees? If so, you're going to have to water more. If it's on the north side of your house uh, where the house is shading it, it doesn't require as much water. So I do keep that in mind with, with the, the shade loving plants. What, what about hosta? Hosta is a great plant. Style, oh, no, no. Or, hosta is okay. wonderful. Uh, hosta, uh, if you have a deer problem or if you have a vole problem, vole is a short-tailed mouse, kind of like a mouse that lives tends to live in the ground. Uh, if you have uh, voles or deer, uh, you're going to have problems with, with hosta because they they like to eat them. But I love hosta. And there's so many uh, big, bold cultivars, uh, Empress Wu, uh, Wu La La, uh, Big Daddy, um, or the big leaf forms can be really cool. Cool. Empress Wu can be four and five feet tall at maturity. Uh, it can really get big um, in in the right setting. And so, yeah, hosta is a really cool plant for the for the shade garden. So I have uh, when my parents left their house, uh, I dug up some of their hosta that was like gigantic. Yes, and I planted it, you know, in the shade corner, and everything was going well. Until a couple of weeks ago, I went out there and some deer have oh, down yes, to them down. Yes, yeah. You know, so I bought some. Uh, what's that green soap? That oh, uh, uh, Irish Spring. I'm gonna try. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna try. I bought so, some Irish Spring. I'm gonna try that. You know, there are all kind of works. remedies for home remedies. You want to call it that for the for the deer, and some work better than others. Uh, my mother has used Irish Spring, and it's worked well for her. But a, a neighbor in town, or not a neighbor, but a lady in town, it doesn't work for her. It's just like you and I. I mean, we have food that we like. You know, your your taste is going to be different from mine. Well, deer can be the same way or their sensitivity of smell. So some deer will eventually get used to that smell of the Irish Spring. Or if, you know, if you're starving, you're going to eat about anything. So if that deer uh, is really, really hungry, it may just think, well, I can tolerate that Irish Spring smell. and I'm going to eat it anyway. <laughs> so so you got to keep that in mind. You know, there are products like Deer Off and Liquid Fence that you spray on uh, that work. But again, if a deer's hungry enough, it's going to decide to take a bite out of it, or it may get used to that smell. So rotating products really helps with that as well. So uh, my wife and I, we have a huge section behind our house. It's all gro- We just let it go. Just whatever happens, happens. Sure. We found some, you know, some mixed wild yeah, yeah. flower seeds. And you know, it's really fun to see it growing up and see, I mean, it's obviously weeds and grass and, you know, it's fun to see the birds eating. And, you know, so what are your thoughts on, Letting things grow natural versus just mowing everything sure. down. So at my so I own a forty five acre farm. I bought three years ago, a mile from my house in Clarksburg, and I'll eventually be building my forever own home on it. So the person I bought it from uh, was bush hogging twice a year, and some some pretty big areas. And I thought, well, I'm going to maybe not bush hog quite as much. <laughs> well. There's the Bradford pear seedlings, which is known as the cowardly pear, that quickly moved in. There's sweet gum galore that's moved in. There's all these invasive plants uh, or, or aggressive plants that's moved in. And, you know, I skipped a whole year and, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I did, it was time to bush hog, it was a nightmare. So you got to look at what's in your area. If you've got Bradford pear seedlings, again, known as the calorie pear, you're going to have to control them somehow or another. Um, the calorie pear produces these thorns that if they get big enough, they can actually puncture a tire. Mm. And, you know, that's an, definitely an invasive plant. So I like to have these natural areas. Uh, in a portion of the farm there's where I don't have those woody plants coming in so much, I have been able to leave some areas that are more meadow-like. Uh, I'm still going to be cutting them at least once a year to keep those those woody plants from coming in. So you got to look at your your in, your your area and see if you don't have those things that are not going to take over. Yes, let it you know let it do. Now what will happen over time if you don't do anything? It'll eventually go back to forest. I mean, it's amazing how quickly a field if you quit mowing it will go back to the woods because there's all these you know that's that's what this country was covered or. Our area was covered in a lot of it was was wood wooded to begin with. Of course, there's different areas that might have been grassland, but um, so you know if you've got these invasive plants around, you got to keep that in mind. And then there's also aggressive plants, and what I mean by aggressive, those are not those are native plants like the sweet gum, like our wild grape um, that are you don't consider them invasive because they're native, but they're aggressive and they can you know, take over as well and can dominate your area. So well, you got to decide. <laughs> exactly. So that that's invasive because yeah. it's non-native. So you got to keep that in mind. Uh, but leaving some areas on my farm, I've left this patch probably like a hundred by 
uh, 25 feet that was actually uh, being mowed before. I mean, like mowed with a lawnmower before I purchased it. And I'm calling it my meadow. And I'm I, right now I haven't mowed it all this year. And it's amazing the little bees and the little butterflies feeding on what I call weeds. But a lot of them are native plants in there. Yeah. And at some point I will mow it. But it's a long way from the tree line, so I don't have to worry about those woody plants coming in. Do you so, throw uh, any wildflower seeds? Or anything so like that? I have actually taken four acres out of the cropland. There's about 20-ish acres of my farm that's uh, rented to a farmer. And I've taken four acres out of that and converted to a wildlife plot. And I've done this through the local soil conservation office. Um, and you can do that. Whatever county you're in, you can co- you can connect up with your, your office there. And there are these programs or cost share programs. And so I sowed uh, four acres using a drill. They provide the drill. You can rent from them to, dr- to drill the seed in. And so that was done in March. And they say it takes about three years to really see much. Well, they're definitely right. So far, I've not seen hardly anything. It's all the, the field weeds from the, the row crop that are left behind, but eventually they'll take over. But I'm looking forward to that. My brother has converted lots of my family's farm into that. He's got the quail plots, the uh, turkey, and the uh, he's got the pollinator plots, all these different plots. And it is beautiful in the summer and particularly in the fall with all these native plants that are really feeding the butterflies, attracting the turkeys, the quail, the wildlife into, into the farm. And so there are lots of wonderful programs out there, particularly if you're farming if your land has been farmed in the past, it qualifies. Or if you've got erosion issues, it qualifies for these programs. So check into that with your local county offices. Well, and we have some space on the, between us and mm-hmm. I-69 where we've been working with mm-hmm. them to grow things. And it's really fascinating. They came out and we worked together to plant. And I mean, to me, they just brought a bunch of sticks and yeah. stuck them yes, in the ground. Yes. And I was like <laughs> thinking, this is a waste of our time. There's no way these sticks are going to turn into anything. And that was maybe three years yeah. ago. And I mean, it is. It's plum, beginning to, yeah. Wild plum. I mean, it's oh, beautiful yeah, back yeah, there. Yeah. Now, to me, it's beautiful. But to somebody driving down I-69, <laughs> they may think it's a bunch of weeds sure, on, sure. The, on the fence. Well, road, and beauty's so. an eye beholder. And, you know, sometimes from afar, it does look weedy. But you get in there and you see all the wildlife going on. You see the, the monarch butterflies. You see the swallowtails. You see, see all these things that the, the life is revolving around all those native plants. And, and it doesn't have to be native. There's lots of great plants uh, that attract the butterflies. Right now, the post I've been making here recently, in the last six weeks or so, I have this uh plant called Aristolochia frimbriata. It's called uh, White Vein Dutchman's Pipe. It is not native. We do have native Aristolochia more in East Tennessee. Uh, and it's the host plant for the pot vine swallowtail caterpillar. And right now there are currently 29 chrysalis on my house where the caterpillars went over to my house, crawled up on the brick and doing the metamorphosis process. Uh, I've had over three or 400 caterpillars on my my patch. And again, it's a non-native, but it's a host plant for our pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. So everything doesn't have to be native. You just want to be be careful to choose plants. If they're non-native, that's not going to take over. Um, but yeah, there's so much going on in our ecosystem if we just slow down. And I tell you, the social media, the Facebook page has actually made me slow down some because when I make a post, it's time consuming, as you know, and I'm trying to do some research on it, but it teaches me a lot too. But it makes me, forces me to sit down sometimes and think about what's going on and reading up on that. And um, it's been very, it's kind of, it's been re- really rewarding to me. So we're going to, we're going to talk more about that in, in just a second when we get back from the break because I'm fascinated with, you know, the things you're doing on. Online. The Hatchie River is a restorative soul nurturing sanctuary, a sacred place, a place to feel connected to something larger than ourselves. The Hatchie River Conservancy is working to conserve and sustain its natural integrity and scenic beauty for generations to come. For more information on how you can help, visit HatchieRiver.org. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our very special guest today is Jason Reeves. And I'm curious, you know, at what point, so you obviously um, have spent a, a career 20 plus years in, you know, getting your hands dirty and working with the flowers. And at what point did you say, you know, I'm going to start sharing some of this on social media? So I went to work for the University of Tennessee and a full time in October uh, 02 uh, to create the gardens in Jackson, the UT gardens in Jackson. And and that was my job to create the gardens and conduct trials for uh, different plants, ornamental plants in, in that climate. And, um, 
I don't know how many years, maybe five, six years after that, we created the UT Gardens Facebook page. And um, I am one of the administrators of that page. Um, I have very little time at the when I'm at work to actually make posts on that page. My job is to be out on the grounds taking care of things. And so, um, I, you know, I begin to share some stuff on that. And then I realized, you know, in the evenings, on the weekends, um, I could reach a lot more people if if I created my own page. Because if I make mistakes on my own page, it's against me. If I make mistakes on the university page, it looks bad on the university. <laughs> sure, sure. And so. I know universities are a lot like government, especially you know, you know, a uh, uh, big state university. Yes. Yeah. There are all these rules you have to sure. follow and policies and so. And then I felt like if it was a university page, I couldn't be talking about things in my home garden. I couldn't be talking. I mean, I shouldn't. Uh, you know, I couldn't sure. be talking about visiting. You know a friend's garden or whatever. And so I created that page um, so I could share my experiences. And, uh, you know, it's it's about with my followers, I now have over 20,000. It's more about I've built this relationship with them. Um, it's not a business page per se. I mean, it, I guess technically in the Facebook world it is, but I'm not selling a product on there. I'm, I'm sharing information on there. And eventually I may be selling some things on it, but it's not, um, you know, I'm not profiting from it. There's I get nothing from it. Um but I'm sharing information because even though – so I work for the research side of the university, not the extension side. So my my job is really not outreach. It's it's more about working at the gardens in Jackson. But I enjoy that, and so I do that on my own time. Again, most of my posts, if you look, if you look at my page, are mostly on the weekends, some at night on the, during the weekday, but sharing my experiences. And I just wanted to get that information out there uh, and so created that page, and I, I have really enjoyed it and, and get lots of positive feedback from it. Well, when do you sleep? Because you're literally, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, man, how in the world does he? In get the this summer, month? I sleep about five hours, sometimes oh, six. I believe in the it. winter, about six hours. So Between I know what you're doing for your own <laughs> yeah. self, and then what you're filming that other people yeah. are doing. Yeah, I'm out there. I don't, uh, I don't require a lot of sleep, and and uh, yeah, I'm pretty, pretty busy and pretty active. So now you focused on Facebook. Um, what about the other the other so, networks? I only do Facebook because I feel like that's all I can handle. <laughs> right. I mean, if it, if that was truly my job, you know, at the university doing that, I would be I would be able to do more. But um, yeah, in my my private life really that's all I can handle. I don't need any more outlets. I, I guess I should. Well, I I follow a lot of people on TikTok. Yes, which has really become my only social media that I really check anymore. Um, and so I'm really thinking you mm. need to be on some TikTok because <laughs> you're already shooting the content. Yes. You know, all you got to do is turn the camera around, <laughs> do, do yourself a little yeah. bit of uh, vertical. You yeah. know, I mean, you you would go, you would be, you would get twenty thousand followers overnight and quickly on yeah. on TikTok, um, because it is a great, you know, it's a great medium. I mean, I love your Facebook. Sure, you know, you're you're definitely getting different audiences yeah yes um on the and do you do instagram at all i don't and uh, the reason i haven't again just uh, controlling you know doing so much which i know they're linked together but if my understanding with instagram you can't tell as a long of a story and you know from my posts i like to tell a long story sure. sometimes and i know people get tired of it and they'll read it all uh, uh, but also, I don't think he posts as many pictures either. So oftentimes, it's a long story. And then I've created in the Facebook page, you know, have all these albums. Um, and so I can, it's actually a tool for me too. Uh, I can go back and search on my Facebook page for a particular post or a particular plant or go to that album. So it it, it benefits me in, in various ways as well. So yeah, I should look into those other things. And you know, when I retire from the university, university which is going to be some years down the road sure. <laughs> i'll be have more time to to open up to those other those other avenues well, i'll tell you what when when i retire i'll just follow you around <laughs> and i'll be in charge of yeah, your social, your social media, media. <laughs> um so what what is the biggest mistake that you see people you're all over the place and you're hearing from people constantly what is the biggest mistake that you're seeing people making when it comes to their their gardens or their land, or their their you know their flower beds, their you know anything. Oh, uh, a couple big mistakes. Let's see. Um, I guess one comes to mind, particularly if you're a new garden or new gardener, is trying to do bite off too much. You really should start small and be successful with that little plot, and then grow a little bit more. You know, if you're a brand new vegetable gardener, you don't need to go out there and till up a half acre of land. You need to start out there with a ten by ten, and you need to be successful with that, and you feel like you've accomplished something. Uh, and then, you know, you can expand next year. So, same way with your with ornamentals or your your landscape. Uh, start off with a little bit and make it look really good and enjoy it, and then add to that. Um, 
Another mistake people make is, uh, you know, I buy plants wherever. I don't care where they come from. I mean, I love to support our local vendors, but if I see a really unique plant that I know that it's going to be great, I don't care if it comes from Lowe's or Home Depot, I'm going to buy it because I'm a plant person. But going to those those box stores and just buying whatever. And there's so much at those places that are not good for our area, our climate. Mm. And so you, you, particularly if you're a new gardener, if you go buy all the stuff without getting advice from a gardener or from a local nursery or independent garden center, and you fail with those plants, you feel like a failure and it might not be your fault. I mean, if you go buy a heather plant or a um, Daphne at Lowe's or Home Depot or a box store, it's not going to survive here. And it's not your fault. It's because it's not for our climate. And so then you feel like a failure and you can, you know, like, I'm not going to do this again. So choosing the right plants, but figuring out what those right plants are by lo- talking to your local independent garden center, uh, nursery, um, and then again, organizations as well will help you. So so choosing the right plant is, is a big mistake. Choosing the wrong plant, I guess, is the mistake uh, that people make. And then overwatering, we've already addressed that some, but yeah, uh, people kill more plants from too much water than, than not enough. Now, I'm, I'm a, a part of my job is tourism, obviously. And so agritourism here in our rural community, we touch, we touch, uh, we brush up against those folks frequently because we want people to come visit West Tennessee and enjoy sure. everything we have to offer. <laughs> what are some of the agritourism businesses that come to mind when you're thinking about places people should go out and visit? Agritourism that come to mind. And I'll start. Yeah, give me an example. One, I'll give you one that I was going to ask you if you uh, have visited is a place called Consider the Lilies in Kenton, oh. Tennessee. <laughs> I was actually there last Monday. So after work, uh, again, a group of us went to uh, we went to see some gardens in Clinton, Kentucky. But we stopped at the, the daylily place first and purchased some daylilies, and then we continued on to Clinton. And, and uh, yeah, so there's lots of places like that. And and um, you know, in uh, Milan, Tennessee, there's Green Acres, and they do pumpkins, they do strawberries, and and then they have other things that kind of revolve around that. And particularly in the fall, um, there's Donnell Farms, and I'm sure there's all kinds of places around Union City I'm not familiar with that play up on agritourism. And you know, there's Century Farms out there now, and they're really playing up on the history of the farm. And so there, there's a lot of agritourism going on. And and uh, you know, eventually my farm, I've planted over 12,000 daffodils in the last three years, and eventually my farm will be open to the public in the spring probably on on the weekends uh, during daffodil season and but then and you'll have to be there you, i will have to be there on the weekends you that's won't right be able to do what <laughs> but you know daffodils only bloom for about six weeks so it'll be yeah. a short time <laughs> consider consider the lilies my wife and i went out there on their big sale yes day. yes yes um and this was our first time i just yeah. saw and i saw it on facebook i said let's go do this you know we didn't think we were going to buy any lilies i mean I can't tell you, I'm embarrassed to admit how much money we spent on lilies at that one, that one <laughs> yeah. thing. And we planted them, you know, and of course they're gone now. But, but next year they'll be gorgeous. They'll come back. Absolutely. You know, but we bought, um, and we put some in some surprise places where we'll, you know, and we've been watering them and everything. And um, But it's crazy to me how... How many lilies that guy and th- that couple? So have out there? I actually count. I got the handout. I think he has close to six up uh, six hundred different kinds of daylilies. Yes. So that sounds like a lot, but there was over a hundred thousand different named cultivars of daylilies on the market. It's because daylilies are easy to hybridize. You and I could, I mean, you could have any of us. Anybody can hybridize a daylily. Uh, you know, you want to come up with something unique out there, but it's easy to hybridize a daylily. They're tough plants, easy to grow. One of my favorite perennials. I have. Uh, um, probably 300 or so cultivars of, of my own, which will eventually be planted the fall this this fall, actually planted at the farm this fall. Um, yeah, dailies are a great plant. And so, yeah, he is as he's retired, and I'm sure he started before he retired, but that's become his agritourism at their their garden. He and his wife and have a great time with it. And it's their passion. And so, uh, you know, getting people out into nature, you know, they're out in the country. You get you turn around, you, you come around this curve, and there's this beautiful field of right. daylilies. Like my, oh my wife gosh. was like, where are you taking me? <laughs> exactly. You know, another place that I love to go is right outside of Brownsville, uh, the Willow. Yeah, Willow Oaks. Willow Oaks so, Farm. So uh, David or, and Sarah Levy uh, own Willow Oaks Farms, and that has uh, been in their family. Uh, David's dad started that, oh gosh, I don't know how many years ago, but I mean like 
50, 60 years ago. And I think in the beginning it was more vegetables and now it's it's more ornamentals. Uh, the ladies do an excellent job of, of growing plants. They uh, grow, they contract grow, which means uh, if you're a landscaper or nursery, uh, you can contract with them to grow you 50 flats of whatever. But they also retail as well. So you can go there and purchase plants uh, for your home garden there. And they're excellent growers. I was there two weeks ago on a Monday evening en route to visit another garden in, in Ripley. And... Um, just excellent product and and uh it, that's um it's not a century farm yet but it's been in the family a long time so has he taken you back to where he his cane oh is yeah growing <laughs> i mean that's crazy it is how what that cane is like back yes there. yes yes so and covering up his truck and everything yep so there, there are lots of neat places like that. And I love those mom and pop operations. You know, I feel like when you're at the Levy's, you know, they, they're passionate about it. They really love and they grow most of that. They buy in just a little bit of trees and shrubs, but most of it they grow themselves. And it's, it's really cool to support somebody that's, that's growing a lot themselves as opposed to, I mean, I want, I want to support all the local garden centers, but you know, some of them buy a lot of finished product in, which is great. But, but to see David and, and Sarah's passion, uh, and then also, I mean, there's supporting that local community all those people that work there that uh you know they're employing is wonderful and and uh it's just a yeah yeah so check out willow oaks in brownsville great great uh, garden center nursery and have, have you visited soleil is a, a garden center close to you? yeah i haven't been since uh, i guess the last time i was there is right after they closed um but i haven't been in since the, the new owners taken possession yeah of they're it, doing but, a great job yeah. it's another really great place to go i mean i have to temper my desire to go to these places yes. because i mean i just get so obsessed yeah. with buying everything <laughs> i see i can't go even to like a uh Home Depot or a Lowe's yes. without checking their sales. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Things, yeah. And things that are quote unquote dead. <laughs> Absolutely. Nobody else wants that are half price. And I'm like, you know, I always just say, well, I'll just take just one more. Yeah. Just yeah. one more. You know, it's funny. There's, uh, there, I've seen this Facebook page before or this meme or mime or whatever you call it, where there's like a half dead plant and there's the person over here saying, oh, it's dead. And there's the other person here, I can save it. I can save it. And so there's some of us that have that mentality that, I gotta, I gotta rescue this plant. And so I know what you're talking about. You see that? I'm like, I can, I can make that come back to life. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Well, we had some, uh, butterfly. We had a butterfly bush that we, that we planted that uh-huh. looked like it died. I thought it was gone. And so I was ready to dig it up and put, and I thought, let me just wait and see. Right now, it is almost as tall as I am. Oh, wow. You know, <laughs> yeah. in one, in one season. Yes, you know? so yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming the roots are going down. Sure. And, they're happy. You know, yeah. So, um, so you, you are obviously the expert, and I know you get all kinds of questions from people. What What's the most frequent question you get from people out there who who are trying to figure out how to have a beautiful garden like you do? <clears throat> well, frequently, uh, oh gosh, there's so many questions that come in. But uh, when I'm doing a landscape design, uh, you know, one of the first things they say, they, they want a landscape that's beautiful but easy to maintain, <laughs> you know, and, and no work, no maintenance. Well, yeah, there's no such thing exists. as that. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't yeah, exist, no. no. But there are lots of, I mean, you, when if you choose the right plant for the right place, you don't have to baby it. Also, when I'm doing landscape designs, I really think about, you know, how the plant's going to mature. Um, I think one of the major mistakes people make, and in, in including landscapers, you know, when a landscaper leaves your house, they want it to look really good. They don't want, they don't want it to look sparse, but you got to give plants room to mm. grow. And putting too many plants in the landscape is a huge mistake. And so... Um, yeah, but placement of plants, uh, spacing of plants. And, you know, again, when you look at that little plant in a one-gallon pot, I mean, it's hard to imagine that thing being 15 feet tall someday. But, you know, for instance, um, there's a, the hydrangea uh, paniculata called phantom. Phantom will be 15 feet tall. But you can buy that in a pot that's a foot tall. It's just hard to vision that thing getting that big. So uh, that's, a, that's a question I get a lot. How big is it going to get? And, you know, how much space do I need to, to allow it to have? But here's what's interesting. So so when you mentioned the specific names of a specific, like you said, the ooh-la-la. Yes. You know, it, which made me, I'm going to write that. Yeah. I'm going to go back and listen to this and write all this down. So. The challenge is if I want something specific, where do I find it? Sure. You know, so I have found that if I want something specific, I can order it online. Yep, Typically, yep. it's so much more expensive online oh, than in a local garden center. And you get, you know, a smaller plant because it's hard to ship a bigger plant. And, of course, shipping day, as you know, shipping has right. gotten ridiculously expensive. Right. So one of the things we do at the university, uh, the gardens, that we have three plant, well, two two true plant sales a year. We have a spring sale. It's always the first Saturday in May, which actually starts on Friday. So if uh, May 
if the first Saturday in May happens to be May 1st, it starts on the last day of, of April, okay. which is confusing. But okay. anyway, and then we have one the first Thursday in October. It's Thursday and Friday. And our plant sales, we focus on plants that are not maybe as easy to find the local nurseries and garden centers. We focus on plants that we've trialed in the gardens that's been good garden performers uh, that we know is going to work well in our climate. Um, and so we offer a lot of those unique plants. We we sell that woo-la-la um, hosta at our plant sales so we really focus in on a lot of the unique plants and um the the purpose of our plant sale there's several purposes one of them is to the the, the funds that we make from those plant sales support the gardens they go back in the gardens they also support our internship programs so like this summer we had three um interns or two three students working for us in the gardens this summer so they provide that money provides funds for them it also provides uh, funds for one of my assistants who's fully funded out of the plant sale proceeds um and so that money goes back in the university. But another, another thing is to get good plants in the hands of people at affordable price. And so we're not trying to make a huge amount of money off of them, uh, but uh, we're we're um, getting those those cool plants into the hands of, of people. Uh, another example I mentioned um the Aristolochia uh, frumbriata, the uh, white vein Dutchman's pipe. Uh, that's a plant I've been growing for 15 more years. It was given to me by Janet Draper, which is a horticulturist at the Smithsonian in, in at the Ripley Ripley Garden at the Smithsonian. And it's not a plant you can find the local nurseries and garden centers. So we propagate that and we sell that at our plant sales. And, you know, you're not going to find that anywhere else. Now, I'd be happy for the local nurseries and garden centers to start propagating it. I'm happy to share seed with them and, and grow it themselves. Uh, but you can get some really cool plants out of our plant sales. So speaking of that, um, I also had this real ambitious plan for this year. I bought little mud balls with mm. moon, <laughs> moon vine. No, no. What is it that... Uh, uh, monarch butterflies. Uh, Sclepius, so two, uh, uh, butterfly weed, probably Sclepius tuberosa or Incarnata. Um, well, I planted a hundred of those and I had big visions of how great it was going to be and the deer ate every single one oh, while they were coming Oh, up. no. So, anyway, I did have, I did, was trying, I was trying to help the monarch butterfly sure, sure. world, <laughs> but I failed miserably. Um, so um, this has been so interesting. Y you, you helped us greatly when we were working on the greenhouses here at discovery park and you've not seen those yet yeah correct? i'm looking forward to them yeah, okay, see yeah this John, afternoon yeah john's gonna uh show you and there of course there's a lot of other interesting things here that happen we have our pollinator gardens behind us which are when was the last time you were here oh it's been well, I don't know, a long six, time seven years okay probably. yeah so there's a lot <laughs> time know, gets away yeah it'll be very interesting yeah. you'll see a lot of things that you you know we have a lot of big plans coming up hopefully you'll be part of some of those so um anyway it's been such a treat having you here well thanks for having me it's it's been a lot of joy today and, and look forward to seeing the grounds here at the discovery park and thanks to all you listeners who've joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.